Last week, we, we did the one before it, obviously, you know, um, but you'll notice it said 2A. I, I chose to divide this section up or this lesson up because there's just too much to try to get to. Uh, last week, we talked about the baptism of Jesus, and we were talking about uh, the, the various Old Testament references that that uh, picked up on. And uh, as you probably know, and we're going to affirm that today, the thing that happens next in the life of Jesus immediately after he is baptized by who? John the Baptist. John the Baptist, yeah. We, I think everybody knows that, right? Everybody knows that Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist. Anyway, good. Uh, the very next thing that happens is that he is led by the Spirit into the wilderness for a, a time of, of uh, fasting and prayer. And this is where we discover him being tempted. Uh, and, and I know a lot of us have studied that and a lot, of, a lot is made about that. Uh, there is a lot to be made about it. So we're going to dig into that a little bit today. Let's read the text. It, it's found in Luke chapter 4. Uh, verses 1 through 13. And again, this is the last of the pink sheets. <clears throat> Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them he was hungry. The devil said to him, if you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone. The devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor. It has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want to. If you worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. The devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot your foot against a stone. Jesus answered, It is said, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished all this tempting, he left him until an opportune time. Now, at the, at the bottom of this first sheet, I've asked you a question. Have you ever experienced what is often called deja vu? You know what, what is deja vu? Yeah, yeah. It's it's to, it's to be experiencing something like right now, but as you're experiencing it right now, you've got this really strong sense that you've you, I've done this before. You know. Yeah. De, do you know what déjà vu means, by the way? Any French speakers in the crowd? A little parlez-vous français? Mm -hmm. Pardon? What? I <laughs> yeah, that sounded almost really French right there. What you <laughs> kind of just mumble a lot. It means it. It means to see, uh, to see again, uh, déjà vu. To see again. Okay, which is kind of what it's describing, isn't it? Now, the reason I'm asking you is not to give you a lesson on déjà vu. Uh, that actually probably wouldn't be a good thing, but because. As you're reading this, as you're hearing this, and if you are familiar like uh, Luke's audience was, particularly with the things of the Old Testament, there should be all kinds of bells and whistles and what we might call deja vu going on because what's happening here is so remarkably parallel to an event that took place in the Old Testament that it cannot be coincidental. It just can't. And so 
since it's not coincidental, we need to take a step back and ask ourselves, well, why, why is Jesus doing this? And I think the answer that we'll discover this morning is really astounding and really kind of, it, it kind of helped. I know when I figured this out, it helped me immensely to kind of get my arms around the, the whole narrative story of Scripture. Because what's happening here with Jesus is something really, really, uh, uh, should be really, really familiar to us. Okay, so let's dig into it. On the, on the back of the page, then, uh, where it says, into the word. So I want to ask this, let's kind of ask the broad question first, and then we'll get into some of the specifics. Maybe, maybe you already are having a bit of deja vu as we're reading this. So the first bullet says, the first thing on Jesus' agenda or ministry is going to the wilderness for 40 days where he is tempted by the devil. What, what do you think is the significance of this experience? What, what is the, why is that so par, integral part of Luke's story? Okay. She's getting a little bit of it, right? Okay. What's that? 40 years. 40 years, yeah. yeah. 40 days, 40 years. Hmm. Yep, that's a, that's a huge part. What about the temptations? I mean, why tempted? And why the temptations that... I mean, why these three? I mean, how many of you have ever, you know... Uh, I mean, I wouldn't fall for that that stone and bread thing. I mean, if that was Jesus, I wouldn't fall for that. You know, that was, I mean, it's like, okay, you're going to have to come up with something a little bit more tempting than that, okay? Uh, but why the, why the three that are chosen? Okay, well, let's get into it. Uh, can you think of another very prominent episode in the Bible uh, that also involved being led by God a link to the number 40 and correspond to the responses to the devil when he was tempted. And Nelda has, Nelda has nailed it, okay? Nailed it, nailed it, nailed it, okay? Uh, yes, the, the clear reference to what's going on here is that this is a retelling of the story of Moses and the people of God being led out into the wilderness, okay? And uh, it's not just, you, 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 might, you, you might think, okay, well, it's just, you can't just say that because there's 40 days and the number 40 is the same and it uses the word wilderness. And, you know, you can't, that's not enough. It's not enough. If that were the basis of making the assumptions that we're making today, that would be flimsy. That, that's no way to interpret scripture. But let me show you some things that will hopefully help you understand this and, and get this. Uh, first of all, um, I, one of the most significant things that helped me to get this is the fact that, did you know that Israel, the people of God, as God was... Uh, calling Moses to lead the people of God. Do you know how God referred to, the peop to these people, these, this nation, as we understand, you know, the people of God? Let me show you something. If you have your Bible, open it up to Exodus chapter 4. This is incredible. Exodus chapter 4. Now, just to set this up a little bit. So, Moses is out tending sheep when he gets the call of God. And he goes through this whole process where he, God gives him this staff and, you know, he heads back to go talk to Pharaoh, right? And in verse, uh, Exodus chapter 4, starting with verse 18. And it says, then Moses went back to Jethro, his father-in-law, and said to him, 
Let me return to my own people in Egypt to see if any of them are still alive. Jethro said, go and I wish you well. Now the Lord had said to Moses in Midian, go back to Egypt for all those who wanted to kill you are dead. So Moses took his wife and sons, put them on a donkey and started back to Egypt and he took the staff of God in his hand. The Lord said to Moses, here's where it gets interesting. When you return to Egypt, see that you perform before Pharaoh all the wonders I've given you the power to do. But I will harden his heart so that he will not let, you, let the people go. Then say to Pharaoh, this is interesting, this is what the Lord says, Israel, Israel, my people, is my firstborn son. And I told you, let my son go so he may worship me, but you refuse to let him go, so I will kill your firstborn son. Israel, the people of God, are referred to as the son of God. Let my son go. That's interesting. Who else do we know is referred to as the son of God? Yeah, Jesus. In fact, in this text, Luke makes the point a couple of times in verse 3 and in verse 9 that when the devil refers to Jesus, he refers to him as son of God, which is a, <clears throat> a very, uh, it's, that term loses a lot of meaning for us because when we think son of God, oftentimes we think son of like next generation, you know, like I have a son, son of Tony, his name is Ryan, okay? But son of God is actually, as we're discovering in the Exodus passage, a very specific term that in the first place had to do with describing Israel, his people. Well, now why would God... Why would God describe these people as his son? That seems weird that he would describe him as his son. Well, <clears throat> the, I think the answer is that what's going on in the story of Exodus with uh, Moses and the people of, of Israel is that they were intended they were intended to be God's representative who through them, the entire world would come to know God. This is God's answer to the fall in the garden. Man rebelled, right? Man sinned. How do we get things right? Okay, well now we know that the way to get things right is by believing in the Son of God. Wow, isn't that interesting, right? We believe in Him. We, you know, He is Lord and so forth. He is, Jesus became the vehicle through which the redemption of all mankind is now possible. Okay, let me say that again. <clears throat> Jesus, <clears throat> by coming from heaven as the son of God, he becomes the vehicle through, through which the redemption, the salvation, if you will, of the entire world is now possible. Prior to Jesus coming in that role, that was the role intended for Israel. Okay, do you know what happens in the wilderness with Israel? What happens in the, what's back in the, uh, well, since we're talking about parallel stories and Jesus is tempted in the wilderness, uh, <coughs> let me ask it again. What do you suppose happened in the wilderness with the Israelites? They were tempted, yes. And in what kind of ways do you suppose that they were tempted? If we're talking about parallels, Food, yep, idolatry. idolatry, 
Yeah, this, it's, I'm telling you, it's uncanny. The parallel here is just incredible, okay? In fact, uh, we discover in Deuteronomy, again, if you've got your Bible, Deuteronomy, uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, it's the fifth book of the Old Testament, and chapters 6 through 8, we're not going to read all this, but you might just jot it down, Deuteronomy uh, chapter 6 through 8, we find that as God is driving out the nations before uh, Israel, as, as they're wandering in the wilderness and he is preparing the promised land for them, uh, we find in chapter 6 through 8 uh, that that this story is, is getting fleshed out. And if you look at chapter 7, verse starting with verse 7, uh, we, we, have you ever wondered why God chose the Israelites to be the me, this, this, you know, why? I mean, uh, we find a very clear answer to that in Deuteronomy 7, 7. Uh, the Lord did not set his affection on you and choose you because you were more numerous than other peoples, for you were the fewest of all peoples. But it was because the Lord loved you and kept the oath he swore to your ancestors that he brought you out of a mighty hand and redeemed you from the land of slavery, from the power of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Know, therefore, that the Lord your God is God, he is the faithful God, keeping his covenant of love to a thousand generations of those who love him and keep his commandments. And what was the covenant? The covenant was that just that was made with Abraham is that you will be the father, not only of a nation, but of nations. That the people who we think of as the people that are being led around by Moses at this point, their ultimate task was to live as the people of God in order that they might be able to then impact and, you know, reach out to others, that, that the kingdom of God would go forward just like we envision it today because of Jesus. And that's the mandate that we have now as Christ followers. So the, there's a tremendous amount of parallel here. Let's look at the, let's look at the temptations themselves. Uh, if you, again, stay in the book of, of Deuteronomy, the first, what is the first temptation? The bread. The bread, okay? And uh, in Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 3, uh, in fact, let's just go back to the beginning of the chapter. Deuteronomy 8.1. Be careful to follow every command I'm giving you today so that you may live and increase and may enter and possess the land the Lord promised on oath to your ancestors. Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years to humble and test you in order to know what was in your heart and whether or not you would keep his commands. Verse 3. He humbled you causing you to hunger and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your ancestors had known, to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. That was the point of God providing food for them. That's Jesus quoting this particular passage in response to uh, the devil when he's being tempted. Okay, let's look on. What's the next temptation? What is, what is the devil wanting Jesus to do? Uh, that's the last one, I think, right? The second one, if... Uh, yeah, it's been... Give, I, I will give you all authority and splendor. If you worship me, it will all be yours. Okay, so the issue has to do with worship, who, you're, who are you going to worship? Deuteronomy chapter 6, starting with verse 4. 
Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit down at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the doorposts of your houses and on your gates. When the Lord your God brings you into the land, he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to give you a land with large flourishing cities you did not build, houses filled with all kinds of good things you, you did not provide, wells you did not dig, and vineyards and olive groves you did not plant. Then when you eat and are satisfied, be careful that you do not forget the Lord who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Fear the Lord your God, serve him only, and take your oaths in his name. Do not follow other gods, the gods of the people around you. For the Lord your God who is among you is a jealous God, and his anger will burn against you, and he will destroy you from the face of the land. Do not put the Lord your God to the test as you did at Massa. Okay? Do not put the Lord your... Again, Jesus is quoting this particular passage in response to the devil, okay? What's the third temptation? What's that? Throw yourself down? <coughs> yes. Uh, in verse, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, stand at the highest point of the temple, throw yourself down, okay? And then he, 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 uh, the devil is really clever here. He quotes Jesus a little scripture. That's always, that's always a wise thing to do. Quote scripture to Jesus. Okay, this might be number one on things never to do when you see Jesus. Okay, <laughs> uh, I mean, unless you're doing some affirming scriptures. Okay, I, you know, but uh, Jesus, I'd like to justify my sinful behavior by quoting scripture. Okay, <laughs> right. He's going to love that. Okay, and then again, go back to Deuteronomy 6 and verse 16, where we find, do not put the Lord your God to the test. So we, we see this. Now, uh, what do we know then about the wilderness, the wilderness uh, wandering of the Israelites in the Old Testament? How did they do? Now, what's happening here in those passages we just read is that they are being given counsel before they go out into the wilderness on how it is that they're supposed to live, okay? So uh, God's going to provide your food. Don't worship idols. Don't have anything to do with them. And don't put the Lord your God to the test, okay? What happened in the wilderness? What happened in the wilderness with respect to food? They complained. They wanted different food. Yeah, they wanted variety, right? They were not satisfied with that. And oftentimes, remember, uh, the Lord told them how he was going to distribute the food. Six days, uh, six times in the, in the week, or, okay, help me out here. Uh, there was one day that you were not supposed to go out and to gather the manna. What day was that? The Sabbath day. Okay. So what, we're, what you would do is, now Saturday, Saturday for them would have been the Sabbath day. Seventh, Sabbath. Okay. So uh, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, they would go out and they would gather manna. They were told only to gather so much per person because that was an appropriate amount. What happened if they gathered more than that? Spoiled. Yeah, it rotted. Okay? Now, on Friday, since they were not going to be able to go out and do it on Saturday, the Sabbath, because it was the Sabbath, the holy day, and they were not supposed to do anything like that. On Friday, they were permitted to go out and to gather a double portion. So they would have enough for Friday and for Saturday, which is cool. And what's really cool about it is now it doesn't spoil. It doesn't spoil the next day. I mean, God is, he's pretty cool. 
I mean, that's, I'm impressed by that, uh, you know, but so, but, but they, they, they struggled with this. They rebelled against God with this. They would go out and they would get more, you know, they would, they would, they just thought, eh, you know, we don't have to follow this. We don't have to be careful about following this. Okay. Now, uh, then the thing about, uh, what do we know about the Israelites and their track record with worshiping God only? What grade would we give them on, if we were going to grade them on their ability to worship only God, how did they do? <clears throat> A big fat F, right? Right. Because they were constantly being, you know, sucked in to the various places that they were going. You know, these places where they were enjoying the vineyards that hadn't been, you know, all that stuff. They, they were always wanting to build alliances with the people of these places, okay? They were trusting in human power instead of trusting in the power of God. By the way, we do that a lot today, but that's another lesson. Uh, so they, they failed at that. So they failed with respect to the bread. They failed with respect to uh, worshiping one and only God. What about putting the Lord your God to the test? How did they do in, on that score? It was another major failure. Okay, time and time again, they would put God to the test with respect to bread, with respect to water, with respect to literally everything. Okay, they were living, they were living, supposed to be living as the people of God, and it was, it was like they were not uh, participating in that. In fact, look at what it says in um, Numbers chapter 4. 14, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, chap, that's the fourth book. We're doing a lot of Old Testament today. You guys are going to become Old Testament scholars. Uh, Numbers 14, 34. This is where, in response to the people's rebellion, God pronounces a form of judgment uh, uh, verse, verse 34, Numbers 14. For 40 years, one year, for each of the 40 days you explored the land, you will suffer for your sins and know what it is like to have, have me against you. Why did they wander for 40 years? Because this is why. Because they were supposed to go in. The truth is, from, from the place that they left, from the place that they left to go and to start heading towards the promised land until actually being able to get there as a people of the promised land, it's been estimated that it would take two weeks. It took them 40 years because of God's judgment. He would not allow them to go in there. One year for each day, Jesus is in the, in the wilderness 40 days. So Jesus faces temptation of bread. Jesus faces temptation of worshiping someone other than God. Jesus faces the temptation of uh, putting God to the test. And how does he do? He passes. Star student. Yeah, he's, he's an over, the classic overachiever, right? Yeah, no, we're, sorry, Jesus, we're, we're just joking. But, um, but no, he, he passed with, with flying colors. And, and what is it that John tells us? What is, what is the most famous Bible verse in all of the Bible, probably? John 3, 16. What does that say, by the way? See that? Yeah. He's the Son of God. Israel was the Son of God. That was their... That was their mandate. That was their agenda. Okay? And they failed. But you know what's cool? God doesn't give up. God never gives up. You know why? Because God is going to keep his promise. He cannot break his promise. I don't know about you, but that gives me a tremendous amount of peace. Knowing that when God says something, it can be relied upon. 
Uh, what do you, how does that strike you when, when we were talking about Israel as being described in Exodus 4 as the firstborn of the Son of God? Did you know, first of all, did you know that? I mean, that's news. Yeah, that's news. Okay. Yeah. What is that, how does that strike you? Does it, I mean, wow. <laughs> Can I get a wow? Okay, maybe. That, okay, now I'm ready for Jeopardy trivia on, you know, uh, bring on the, that's got to be a thousand dollar question on Jeopardy, right? Uh, who is known as the son of God in the Old Testament? Who is Israel? Okay. All right. That's a thousand dollars. Anyway, uh, what about, uh, why would, why would Luke tell the story of Jesus in this way? I mean, it's a weird way to tell a story, isn't it? I mean, by the way, that's what we're doing. We're telling the story of Messiah, how Jesus is the fulfillment of these things. You know, weird way to tell the story. Maybe not. Maybe it's the perfect way to tell the story. Maybe the weird thing is we don't get the references. It's kind of like an in, you know what an inside joke is, <coughs> right? It's like somebody says a joke and I don't get it because there's, there's certain information that I'm not privy to that if I knew that information, it would make the joke funny, right? Okay, that's kind of the way we are in a lot of respects because for many of us, we have treated the Old Testament as something to be kind of avoided. You know, there's some really good stories in there, okay? You know, we could probably, I, I would imagine, like, if you were like me, when I was in Sunday school growing up as a kid, I could tell you the stories from the Old Testament that we were going to hit on. Okay, now I've got, I know we've got some Sunday school teachers in the, in the house today. What are some of the classic Old Testament stories that, that we hear about? Right. Creation, probably, right? Uh, if, it's, if it's a really, you know, it probably bordering on, on, uh, on deep would be the Tower of Babel, you know? You know? Uh, that one didn't always get covered because that's kind of a random, I mean, talk about random. Really, it's not, but it, I mean, it, it really does fit nicely into what's going on. But, but there's this, there's the way we've approached the Old Testament. In fact, I'll confess to you that, that the way when I went to Bible college, uh, the way that the Old Testament was presented <clears throat> was, uh, in fact, the title of the, the, title of the course, it was, it was two three-hour classes that you took your freshman year, okay? The survey of Old Testament literature. Survey of Old Testament literature, Okay? And the teacher, who was a, a wonderful guy, brilliant, but it basically what we did, it was, it was more or less kind of a Sunday school, a children's approach to Sunday school, except at a college level, if that makes any sense. Basically, what we did is we, we went from, you know how like power lines, work with me here, power lines, you know, they're, they're, they're up at the top and then what? There's a valley, right? And then they get to the next line. You know, that's just the way they are. That's kind of the way the approach was to the Old Testament. We kind of go from power pole to power pole. And, and we'd had to, we had to read the whole thing. We were expected to have read it and be tested on it. Everything was, you know, there, everything was, was uh, up for test. But primarily, the focus was upon those key stories. Okay, now, what I learned later on in life, uh, not in Bible college, but just by doing study on my own, was that there is a lot more to it than that. Now, if I would have gone on, you know, in, in all fairness, it was a freshman class, okay? It was a, it was a 
one, it was a OT 101 class, okay? So it was very introductory. And I did have some other classes later on in the Old Testament. But as I'm going to talk about this morning in my sermon, the problem with, that, with those classes, they were called Critical Introduction to the Old Testament. That was, that was one. That was a three-hour class. And basically, it, it could be, I could, I could summarize. Have you ever had college classes that you could summarize in like 10 words? Okay, here's one. Critical Introduction to the Old Testament. Bible, if, if you believe in God and in the supernatural, this is understandable. The things in it are understandable. But if you don't believe that God is all-powerful, then this is what's wrong with the Old Testament. That's basically what the course was about. And it was yeah, disappointing. It's only in years since that I've, I've, I've spent time reading and thinking and stuff that a lot of the things that I'm sharing with you are starting to come to light. And uh, the parallels that are there. Uh, this is not, as I said, this is not a coincidence. This is, this is a part of, of God's plan. You know what else God is besides someone who keeps his promises? He is like redundant. I mean, he, he travels... He travels the same road, you know, and it's it may be different. There may be some nuance to it. There may be something a little bit different about it. But it's amazing how uh, things are repeated and, and over and over. Uh, so Luke is presenting the story of Jesus in such a way that it looks very similar to that. And now Jesus is assuming the role of Israel. Okay, if you could think about it in that way. The role that Israel had back in the Old Testament now is being fulfilled and done excellently by Jesus. In fact, later on in his ministry, he's going to take this even a step further with the establishment of with the temple and his, you know, stepping into the temple and assuming various things about the temple and about authority over that. We have a lot to, to cover. Don't forget, when we first started this study, we were talking about, you know, this is why that, that prologue that we started was so important. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who, were the, who first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I decided, too, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. There is so many references here to fulfillment and having been taught and so forth, as we talked about. This is a classic example of that. Now, uh, let me just, we have just a couple minutes. Questions? I know we've, we've covered a lot of ground today. And there is so much more that could be said about this. Next week, we're going to get into the first lesson of the blues section, uh, which we're going to transition into the section called the ministry of Jesus. This is actually where his public ministry starts. He comes out of the wilderness you know, the temptations and so forth, and he actually starts his ministry. As we get ready for that, I would encourage you to think about what does ministry look like? How is ministry done, and how did Jesus do it? Because he gives us some incredible insights that we would be wise to, to, to follow as well. All right? All right. It's good. To, I'm glad we get to hang out and uh, do this. So... Uh, make sure you've got notes and all that kind of stuff. Let's get ready for church this morning. And now, Father, as we close this uh, session, I just pray that you would help us, that we would think about not only the particular things that we've talked about this morning, but, but also how that, that your message and your purposes and your promises span the entire scope of time. You are awesome. And as we 
learn more about you and, and how you've put this all together. It's intriguing. It is intricate. It's beautiful. Help us to celebrate that and to help us to realize how wonderful it is, how blessed we are to be in your family and to be committed to being your people. Be with us now as we prepare for worship. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.